Welcome to the Tech and Toast podcast. My name is Chris Fletcher and I'm your host. Tech and Toast simplifies the way you buy and manage your hostile tech. Do you need help untangling your tech? Head to our website, techontoast.community and grab yourself a free tech audit. Find your next tech solution on our marketplace, attend our events or simply say hello. We're here to help support the industry into the next generation. This podcast is brought to you today by Square. Picture this, all the tools you need to run your business seamlessly managed under one roof. From point of sale software and hardware to payments, Square's first party solution integrates it all into one single dashboard. Beyond that, Square also offers team and inventory management, gift cards, and tools that will help you drive loyalty programs and marketing campaigns. So in a nutshell, Square streamlines your operation by pulling everything together under one roof as a single source of truth, helping you save time. Whether you're running a restaurant, cafe, bakery, bar, pub, or club, Square helps you simplify the way you do business and take payments. Square is trusted by over 4 million businesses globally. Get 20% off Square with Tech on Toast off countertop hardware with promo code SquareUK20. Visit square.com to use the promo code or to request to speak to one of our sales team. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the next episode of Tech on Toast podcast. And today I'm be delighted to be joined by Champa Magesh. How are you, Champa? I'm doing great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're all most welcome. And you're the MD of Access Hospitality. That's correct. Yes. How long have you been there? It's not, you've been there, what, oh, was it October you told me? Sorry. Yes, from October last year. Wow. And how's it going? Are you enjoying yourself? Absolutely enjoying it. I mean, it's my first sort of exposure to hospitality. I, I will declare. That. Yes, I'm not. Well, we were just not a hospitality <laughs> insider. I'm Do you know afraid. what? But I was talking, interestingly, I was talking to Dojo at their head office in Paddington, their CTO, Nick Fryer, and he was talking about them solving the problem of payments. Uh, and they talked about the fact that none of their devs are from hospitality. And it was quite deliberate in that because they're not emo- they're not emotionally connected to the problem. And sometimes I think people like you coming into our industry is really important because I think it needs a fresh set of eyes sometimes to go, guys, why are you doing that? <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, look, I mean, in my career, I've sort of always worked um, in B2B right. in the technology space. And I've been very fortunate to work for multiple industries. I'm, you know, I'm not I'm not an inside industry insider anywhere. But the reason I've sort of made that conscious choice, and I think as a consequence of that experience, I have a great deal of respect for what makes an industry special. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, business is business at the end of the day, right? Like we're true. all trying to grow revenue and maximize profit so that we have that in common across all industries. But then every industry has a very different dynamic. And having switched from mining to pharmaceutical distribution to internet technology to fintech to travel. Um, I'm just tired listening to you, but... <laughs> I've sort of been able to sort of one of the things that I've learned through those transitions is not to take my past experience for granted, which is what I enjoy. It keeps me on my toes, keeps me fresh. So what I'm really learning, which I anticipated, was really learning from customers, from hospitality operators. You know, what makes that industry tick? What is on top of mind for them? What is special about the industry? And what have you got from that so far? Because that's that's the unique question, isn't it? Because you've been in what six months, I suppose. Uh, yeah, probably a bit more. More, more. Yeah, a bit more. But and what I suppose if you had to like put your key learning in of what you think about the industry or or the crazy people like us who work in it, <laughs> what do you think? Well, I wouldn't characterise as crazy. I think. Well, first of all, I think hospitality is a very special industry, right? Yeah. Um, because everything that hospitality does, I think, is about building memories. I always think about what is the purpose of an industry. You know, beyond the we're all running businesses. Yes. And I think certainly hospitality, you know, we, we used to say when I was in the travel industry that it's about building dreams yeah. right, and making them a reality. I think in hospitality, it's about making memories. You know, all everybody will have in their lives a happy occasion and it's in a hospitality venue, yeah. right? Like you remember the occasion with the venue. The venue makes the memory. And I think that's what the hospitality industry does. The other thing that makes this industry very special if you take any country in the world, it's probably one of the biggest employers as an industry in that country. Yeah. I think it builds fabric of communities. You know, it builds the fabric of our high streets here in the UK. Really does. And I think we, you know, we don't we we don't quite appreciate that when we just think about it as individual businesses but when you think about it at an industry level it really really matters to the quality of life in any country so i think these are things that are fundamentally very special about the industry and i think given all those things it's a people business 
And interestingly, I always thought being in technology, the technology is a people business because technology is about making ideas into a reality. And machines don't have ideas. It's people who have <laughs> ideas. <yet>. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently yeah, they, yeah. I, they may, but still, you know, uh, do we point them in the right direction? So for me, the fact that being I get to work in a technology business that serves the hospitality industry means that it's even more of a people business. Yeah. And I really, really enjoy that about hospitality. Um, the travel industry that I came from, there's a lot of overlap in that sense because travel is also a very yeah, is people this, focused. Is it similar? Because I would, I would imagine that there's, that, oh, obviously there's crossover because there's, there's people, I think you alluded to dreams and memories. There's, there's a similar theme running through it, right? But what were, you, what were you doing exactly in travel? Were you working? I was responsible for, um, I was in the distribution business for travel. So global distribution system, which is tech again, yeah. um, in terms of distributing airline inventories, hotel inventories, um, supporting travel agents on UK high streets, for example. I was responsible for the global uh, business of one of the GDSs, Amadeus. Wow. So, yes, I know Amadeus. Yes. yes. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a huge job. Well, yes. you've got another one now, though. <laughs> yes. I'm very fortunate in that respect. So, so I think there's a lot of overlap, but... There's a lot of things that are very different. So if you look at, for example, uh, in the hospitality business, given it is a people business, you know, the ability to recruit and retain talent yeah. is a very big part of the equation. When you look at the macroeconomic circumstances, you know, what's happened with energy costs, food inflation, it's such a big proportion of the you know, of the costs that hospitality businesses have to pay. Um, and then you look at the changing in consumer behavior. Yeah. You know, we've had COVID, which was a massive change. And then you had the boom following COVID. But then now consumer behavior has changed yet again. And then you have the demographic changes with, you know, young people drinking less, for example. So there's a lot that you know, that immediately affects the hospitality industry because how we live our lives presents itself first, I think, within the hospitality yeah, industry. Yeah, I, th I think we're always at the front of change. Exactly. Uh, there's, there's always, you know, if something's happening, we tend to feel it first. And I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I'm going totally off my questions here. Sorry, Champa. Uh, <laughs> but um, in terms of product then, because you talk about the changes that we experience, how hard is that to reflect back in product then if you're building product? And, and I, I know you guys tend to bring product into your business rather than build it, but you still have to, you know, run yes. it and maintain it. How, how, how does that change influence that? Because that's that's quite hard, I suppose, to react and or not react when you when you don't need to, to when yeah. it might just be a bit of a, a blip as it would be. Yeah, it is a judgment call, yeah. and I can't pretend that we always get it right. But yes, the first thing we do, of course, is we we tend to buy businesses that already have a product that has a product market fit. Yeah, right. So that's the first thing. So we know. I should say that if anyone doesn't know access, that's you know you guys have multiple products. We do, yes. and we're very fortunate. I think we have a very comprehensive portfolio of products you know we're able to serve all of front of house all of the back of house and operations requirements and also serve hotels as well in all of those capabilities so in that sense you know we have a very comprehensive portfolio so and the way we do that is we go out and we you know get to know businesses that have products that have a really strong product market fit you know meeting the needs of hospitality operators in the market and you know if they're a good business and we're able to do a deal we acquire them and then what we do is we maintain very close relationships with our customers. So a big part of it is talking to our large customers, talking to our mid-sized customers, understanding what our you know long tail of customers are doing. We're very fortunate in that, you know, I would sort of say that almost every hospitality venue probably has one access product in it in the UK because of the breadth of product portfolio we have. And therefore we have a breadth of data. And we're able to see how the market is changing and evolving. Um, you know, we're able to see, for example, how food and beverage in hotels is operating versus a restaurant or a quick service. Yeah. And we're all sort of, you know, we will make some bets and we'll say, well, we think, you know, this will all converge into this and we'll speak to some customers about it and then make the bet to say, OK, let's start to develop this. Uh, it's it's really interesting the data side because it's not something I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought of actually but you, yeah you have the I suppose you have so much interesting data from all the different products you have in your business uh, touching as you said all different departments but all different um, operational strands which I think uh, and being able to predict that future becomes very valuable yeah right, if you absolutely get that right. I mean the other day we were looking at some statistic 
Procure Wizard, which is one of our procure yes. to, uh, pr procurement and stock control products. Um, we crossed a massive milestone, which is um, we have a trillion pounds worth of transactions what? <laughs> that has gone through that product, right? Wow. So it's it's quite an interesting milestone. So, you know, we were joking that that's a lot of cucumbers because <laughs> that's the most popular uh, commodity. That's the problem with stated. data. You get into the, <laughs> once you start uh, peeling the onions, I say, uh, you start finding out stuff that you really don't need to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very interesting. And you and you have, a, obviously, you have a leadership style because you've if you look at your career, the way you've come through different businesses, and as you say, you don't attach yourself particularly to an industry you you do your job if, if, that sound, if that sound does that make sense but you kind of do what you've been asked to do and then you go to the next challenge how how are your leadership um what you've learned i suppose over even though they're from multiple industries how will it impact what you're doing at access it's still early days obviously i'm sure you're very busy but um how will it impact what you do there in terms of what you learned in the past yeah i think it's a well one of the reasons uh, you know, I, I don't think of it as having done a job. A job is never done. There's always more <laughs> yeah, to do. I couldn't think of that um, way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, but I think I've always moved when I felt that um, I've stopped learning. Right. Yeah. We all sort of, even though there might be more to learn, for whatever reason, we might sort of settle into a comfort zone and we might yeah, get go, your slippers oh, off. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm in cruise control. And I think that's very dangerous for any leader because yeah. there is always more to learn. But psychologically, we all find ourselves in that zone at some time or the other. So whenever I've got into that zone, I've sort of give, given myself a kick up the backside and gone, right, go into something you have no clue about out and start learning again it's you know? a very self-aware thing to have though isn't it to, to have that because I, I know in you know in the in our in, in the hospitality industry that actually there's a lot of general managers or area managers at that level will stay in their roles too long in my opinion uh, they, they will and they'll have those slippers on <laughs> without knowing it and to be really self-aware of or it depends I suppose what kind of person you are but to have that drive to say right yeah. next challenge I agree I think it depends on the kind of person yeah. right like for some people that's absolutely the right thing and yeah. they may actually be very disciplined about continuing to learn yes, while being in the comfort zone yeah. um, I know my me and that's not me <laughs> you know I tend to get lazy um, <laughs> when I you know know 50% of something and so that I've used this as a way to challenge myself so therefore when I've come into the hospitality industry obviously I understand tech I understand you know how to take products to market I understand how to scale a business um, you know we, we have a we are very ambitious in access. We're a high growth company. You know, we, we're a global company and we want to continue to grow. And, and you know, f from an access hospitality perspective, we want to serve hospitality operators all around the world. You know, we want to be the world's leading hospitality tech platform that is AI enabled. So, you know, that ambition was very attractive. And those are things I've done. You know, I've worked yeah. for global businesses. I've, you know, scaled businesses, etc. But the reason I chose to be part of Access, particularly the hospitality division, is because I didn't understand the industry. And so I, love that. I knew that, you know, the, my curiosity, you know, can be satiated, right? Like I can meet customers, understand their needs, understand how Access can do better in terms of serving customers. And interestingly, I mean, you don't have to get into detail too much here, but what... Is there a common thing you find uh, when you enter these roles, when you come in, and it, not about underperformance or anything like that, but is there a common thread you think, oh, God, I've seen this before. I know how to deal with this. Yeah, I mean, you. there's lots of, you know, I'm almost sort of, sometimes you've got to watch out for the false positives. Yeah. You know, it's very easy. And, you know, we all do this, right? I was a 90-day plan. <laughs> and so, you know, in 90 Everybody's days, you 90 go around day. the business, yeah, yeah. you meet people, you meet customers. And you draw conclusions, right? I think that's too simplistic, mm. especially in today's world where the business context changes very, very rapidly. And so trying to draw, trying to figure out to what extent is your past experience still valid, I think is part of the challenge today in business. You know, because two years ago, AI wasn't as prevalent as it is today, yes, yeah. right, in the tech world. So decisions I would have taken two years ago in the absence of AI as a tool, you have to question whether today they would stand that test of time and whether I would take that decision again. 100%. And if I came in and went, oh, I've seen all this before and therefore I'm going to respond to this in this way, I might be missing a trick. 
And I, and so I think while I'm not saying past experience is invalid, I think it's sort of being able to decide, I have seen this before, however, am I drawing the right conclusion from it? That's given about the that current learning context? again, though, isn't it? Yeah. And I, and I asked, I was with a, a group of uh, 40 operators in Birmingham last week, and uh, I asked them, um, I said, put your hands in the air if you use AI. And these are from Turtle Bay, a uh, big hotel and then a load of independent guys and every single person put their hand up and I said were well, you using it a year ago no one had their hand up and I said how many of your bosses know you use it no one had their hand up so they must have been all marketing people yeah. writing blogs over. but it's really interesting isn't it how it had that it's had that AI has had that impact and um, I think it's really moving it's, it, there, obviously there's a movement behind it but for me it's about how you use it in particular yes. places AI isn't for me isn't a broad brush it's how you apply it into certain things that will make people's lives easier you get there quicker Yes. I think that's the right way to look at it for now. I'm sure you clever guys at Access will probably think of it in a different way soon. But um. Yeah, I think there's huge. I mean, look, if you think about the problem statements that hospitality customers have, a lot of it is about how do you deliver productivity, Yeah. right? Um, because people is, you know, the greatest asset in the industry, but also a biggest cost yes. and incredibly difficult to be able to recruit and retain um, talent, right? So how do you make your people productive is a problem that AI intrinsically is developed to solve, right? Yeah. It's first and foremost, the use case is about productivity. Yeah, it's quicker. And I think we, at Access, and you would expect me to say this, and I will say this, that <laughs> I think we are uniquely positioned to be able to solve that problem because where AI truly comes into its own is when you have a platform and you have data, right? So, for example, if you, you know, we, we have Rotoready, which is a workforce planning um, scheduling software. Great product. We also have Design My Night and Res Diary, which is a reservation software. Now, you could put AI into those individual products. We do. Rote already has some AI capabilities that we'll be coming to the market with. But what is even more powerful is if someone had an access reservation capability and Rotor Ready, and the two are integrated, Rotor Ready can then make scheduling decisions or the AI capability can already do demand forecasting, et cetera, based on the data from reservations, right? Yeah. Now, even more powerful then, if you connect up a CRM, Actual, from Access, to all of this capability, yeah. then you can have AI starting to power up marketing campaigns based on the scheduling data and the reservation data. Yeah, it, and I think that's the real power, right? We, we have this endless conversation on this podcast about best in class versus all in one. Now, you're weird because, not you, but because you you have the best in class, but you also are potentially all in one in terms of a company that owns them. Uh, and I, I, I think it's becoming more and more prevalent that people want their work done for them. Mm -hmm. uh, operators need help. <laughs> like I just every time I talk to them about it, we have this phrase untangle your tech and we use it we're using it more and more every week with it through our marketing through our operators and because they're engaging with it which says to me that actually you know imagine a headphone cable in your handbag or your bag all tangled up that's what they feel like with mm -hmm. their technology at the moment and I think it's Undoing that, unpicking that problem is huge, right, across the industry. It's so vast. Uh, but I think it's becoming more and more obvious that they want best in class, but they want also help in terms of how they talk to each other, in terms of integration. Agreed. And, and I think, look, I mean, people ask me this all the time, right, because we do have a comprehensive portfolio. And I say, look, we want to be the world's leading platform. You know, a lot of customers will say, does that mean I need to take everything from access, right? Now, I would love for people to take everything from access. But I think there's almost in technology, there's almost like two schools of thought in this, isn't it? You know, if you look at our consumer lives, I think it's probably the best example. You have the Apple approach, which is, you know, I'll give you everything, but you have to buy Apple stuff for it to work with Apple stuff. You know, if you try and get something else to work with Apple, it'll, you know, it'll be awkward and it's by design. Yeah. You know, Steve Jobs was very clear that I'm not going to help you work by my competitor products. That's the Apple philosophy. And then you have the Android philosophy, which is you have an ecosystem, you pick and mix what you want, and they all work together. They integrate because there's an Android standard. Between those two schools of philosophy, in Access Hospitality, our philosophy is very much the Android philosophy. Because as much as I'd like everyone to choose Access products, I would like that to be the choice that the operator makes yeah, cause based on their situation. Yeah, because almost, you know, like that you have this Agreed. making operators do something which 
doesn't seem right to me. But you know, it's like. But I think if they can have that choice, and I think they'll end up making the right choice anyway, if they understand the the integration argument behind it. That obviously, you your business case is not that right. You want everybody to as many people to work with you as many products as you can. But also, the flexibility of doing that opens you up to a wider audience, and also lets people see what products you have, right? Absolutely, and I think look, ultimately, as you said, and I love the term "untangle the tech." Big problem with untangling the tech is if you then sort of insist on everybody. It means you have to untangle it, or you can make it easier by building an ecosystem. Yeah, and that, and we're all about the ecosystem. And hopefully, if we can make that ecosystem easier, people will choose access products. It seems to be coming more. I, I see that a little bit more last. As, as, last 12 months I think I've seen more of that kind of working together or working out oh look we can sell our three products together and have a real benefit to the operator and I've seen that in your case actually I totally forgot I'd done that webinar but <laughs> but that that's a really good example of it and there was another one as well I did last week but yeah I, th I think operators are moving slowly towards that mm -hmm. um, and in terms of in terms of, I suppose, understanding our industry and the operators that are within it, how, how's that going? Because you mentioned to me before we came here, it's quite emotive. <laughs> I would agree with you. Uh, is that again something that you're having to tackle in terms of the way that your team would manage that, or is it, or is, is it kind of like, is it hard to put business in front of emotion? I suppose I'm asking. I think that, you know, you asked me what's common about all business. I think it's that's always the case. When you deal with customers, there's always emotion involved. Yeah. The emotion presents itself in different ways, right? That's true. Um, and so I think being able, to, when you scale a business, you know, to be able to drive certainty, and I'm sure it's the same with operators, right? When they're thinking about mm -hmm. what is my customer experience in my brand, they're trying to get consistency and predictability. Yes. So they will have you know, protocols and here's how we, we do things. But, you know, when the, when the guest walks through the door and maybe their requirements are slightly different, there's a choice that your frontline employee has to make. Do you go, no, we don't do that because my rule book says this, or do you go, well, I'm going to help the guest out, right? That's a bit of, that's the, the bit that I think every business has to sort out. To what extent you give that empowerment to your people and to what extent do you actually get it right but still deliver a consistent and predictable experience? That's really interesting because, yeah, I've worked for brands where, uh, Hard Rock Cafe, for instance, who are very much focused on... Um, enabling their team, empowering their team to go and make decisions. And if you're a general manager, have your own payroll, your own, you know, your own marketing within your own site. But with that, you're giving an individual like me <laughs> responsibility to make decisions, which probably fell out the rule. But now they, for a long time, had a very good way of doing that. And the culture worked right. But the minute you dilute that culture or something changes or something goes wrong, I think you lose it very quickly. And I, I, I think if you think of car line manufacturing, I always think of manufacturing when I come to, I know they're nothing like each other, but it's still humans putting together something and delivering it to a customer. And I always wonder how, and this might be the AI chat or what we talked about before, how do we get from that process of kind of that real efficiency? But those guys have stats for the way their people put on a brake pad or whatever it might be on a car and all the way through that and they, and they time it to the nth degree. How we get there, I don't know if it's possible, but yeah. And this is the tension, yeah. right? Because you can give empowerment to your employees, but then if you give it to them, then the experience that the guest gets depends on the employee. Yeah. So therefore, it's not predictable and consistent. So if you get another employee, your guest will get a completely different experience. And then what message are they taking away about by the brand? I'm sure as a marketeer, you know, our operators, you know, in the marketeers will be thinking about that. So this is a challenge in every business. So yeah. we have that as well in, in access, right? So, you know, we obviously have Here's our here's our process. Here's how we measure NPS, and here's the here's the experience that we want our customers to have. You know, and we have rules. Now our customers will then go, well, you know, can we do it this way, oh, and can we do it that way? <laughs> yes. And then, to what extent do employees have to stick to what is the rule, and to what extent can we give some flex in in all of this? This is something that is always a balance that is difficult to strike. And I'd be lying if I said we have the balance right in access. Yeah. But having said that, a big part of having spoken to customers, we see that as something that we want to change, yeah. right? And so a, a, a one of the big cultural shifts we're making is, you know, I kind of making it clear that within access hospitality, are we a tech company that serves the hospitality industry or are we actually a hospitality tech company? 
And for me, we're a hospitality tech company. That's our reason for existence. Yeah. So for the culture we are delivering is we're here to serve, just as our customers are here to serve. And if that is the cultural overtone under which we make those decisions on how much of the rules do we flex in terms of the predictability versus the customer experience. So, you know, it's a start. We'll go on a journey. And, you know, I count on our customers to give us feedback when we get it wrong. They'll all be mailing in, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, and from that, though, because you're, I mean, you're, I suppose, giving uh, giving your guys permission to serve as it would be. Uh, how do you then promote, I suppose, innovation, collaboration? Because it's, well, how big is the group? How, how many people? Uh, well, there's about, within Access Hospitality now, we have a thousand people around oh, the wow. globe. Okay. So that's a lot. So, yeah. So how do you kind of uh, get these guys to, I suppose, innovate? We used to call it innovate and create at every opportunity at Hard Rock. That was our one of our mottos. How do you kind of encourage that within a business like that? You know, obviously, you've got experience doing it before. But as you say, everything's different. How are you helping those guys on that on that journey, as you called it? Yeah. So I think really important. And some of the things I'm going to say, as the American says, motherhood and apple pie, right? <laughs> I love this. Um, You're educating me. This is good. This is why I do this thing. Um it's really about getting close to the customer, right? So, you know, in a business, it's very easy to get enamored by our products because our products allow us to earn revenue. And then we think about our P&L, et cetera, which obviously as an MD, I do all the time, yes. right? But if you think beyond that, really, it's our customers who, you know, give us the, 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 the privilege of being able to serve them with products. So it's about really focusing on the customer. So how do we focus on the customer and, you know, how close are we to the customer and how the people closest to the customer have the empowerment either to make decisions or raise the red flag? Because, you know, it's raising the red flag sounds rather obvious, but if you have a very top-down culture where it's like three-line edicts, no one's even going to raise their hand that we're yeah. getting it wrong. So as a first step, let's get people empowered so that they're telling you, hey, we're getting something wrong here. Really they've got wrong. the feedback, right? These guys on the ground. It's As it happens, they see it, right? Yeah. They, they see the, 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 where the process is broken, where perhaps, you know, just some common sense things that we're missing out. Um, and so, you know, getting that empowerment is 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 big part of it. Um, and focusing on that customer and measuring it, you know, where what is the customer experience like? You know, we do trust pilot reviews. We look at that. We reward employees who get five star trust pilot reviews. Um, you know, so we, we're constantly looking at what is our NPS. So that's the first step. The other step is then to say, how do we get the products closer to the customer? And how do we ensure that there are empowered teams who are constantly thinking about how the products are serving the customers? Very often, you know, when you think about products and customers will say this, right? Like, what do they want different? They'll talk about features and functionality. You know, I want this button and I, you know, this. But actually, when you think about what delivers value to a customer, it could be as simple as we just need the product to be simpler to implement. You know, so it may not have all the bells and whistles, but if it's simpler to implement, easier to train, then you're getting your return on investment quicker, quicker yeah. and people will use it. It's easier to adopt. These are things that it needs to be focused on to Where really think. Where does that get think. lost, just out of interest? Because I, I think that's a really good point because there's a lot of the issues we will talk about in our meet in our content is about adoption about you know you roll out a product spend all that money buy it in everyone's excited you put it in the boardroom made the decision goes in and then it doesn't really return yet because it might take two years now because we messed up the adoption where where do you think that is that is that where it's going wrong where the, do you think the do you think people get lost in their product the yeah, front end why you did it i suppose yeah so i think there's a question of why you did it yeah but also i think there's a you know if the company processes change so the product could have been set up and the adoption could have been amazing, right? But then the company changes, the customer changes, you know, they have a new MD, they put out a new process, they decide to do things differently. Nobody thought to then change things in the way the product is set up. Yeah. And then it's around peg in a square hole. That could be one reason. Another reason could be, and this happens often in hospitality because you have a high churn rate of employees. Yep. You, Someone was trained, they had everything set up, they know exactly how it works, and then they leave. New person comes in, new person didn't have the luxury of being trained yep. again. 
they then sit there, they're under pressure, they don't know how to use things, and then they go, oh, the, the tool isn't great, because when I was in my previous business, I used this other tool, if only we had that tool, it would work. I mean, we, we see this all the time, you know, we use sales and marketing tools, and, you know, we go, we have one of the best tools in the world, but we aren't using it as it's meant to be, and of course, then everybody complains about it, because the data is never right, the report is wrong. You're describing so, my life here, but... <laughs> which is, I think, this is a fundamental issue yeah. with technology where I think what is particularly exciting about AI is that we can start to change that because this has always been it, not just in hospitality you know when I was in Amadeus or any of the other um, you know tech businesses I've been in this is a number one complaint about technology and adoption things change and then some human being has to remember to yeah. I need to change a setting or get a training or whatever with AI, you can have in-product prompting. You so can have, someone churns and someone new starts. And, and then trigger. the AI can yeah. go, hey, you're new, and here's a bite-sized 10 seconds of some of the most frequent things that you may want to do. And then even if they're doing something wrong, it could be like, you know, like Siri or, or something. Pop hey, say, yeah, pop stop. Up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or here's a, yeah. t you know, a bite-sized training video on what you might want that's to do. That's not far away, right? We, we could do that now, right? Well, that's a big part of, you know, within Access, we've made uh, investments in AI. And in fact, we are, you'll see across all our hospitality products, we will start to bring in Access Evo, which is our AI capability. So we will start to do that. We already use AI at the moment in terms of in-product support. Um, and we'll start to bring in additional AI capabilities through Access Evo. So th this allows us, because we have access to all the data, we understand the usage patterns, we can almost then, you know, prompt users in, in doing things. We can alert, you know, when something goes wrong. So, for example, to use the example of Procure Wizard, you, you've run out of stock of cucumbers. You know, so when, you, when you're going low, the AI assistant on mobile could alert Huge. and say, hey, you're low on this. I can see your reservations. I can see the menu that has been put in. You don't have enough cucumbers. Here's the order with your vendor. This is the cost. Click a button. You don't even have to create the order, right? It could be pre-populated. So I think, you know, the use cases are just spectacular you could yeah you know there's a they're, list they're what they used to call the shoulders of the problems right you have the big problems labor food cost all these different you know the big things that challenge us but the little bits the nuances you're talking about there that only uh, well, obviously you know because you're serving the industry but only the operators would little bit they'll listen to this and go yes that that's a pain in my backside and they obviously everyone talks about the zero to 90 day problem of people churning uh, as in staff churning within the first 90 days because we didn't onboard them properly because we didn't do the training properly because we didn't buddy them up and all this kind of stuff but ai you're right i think changes all of that if you do it in the right way and the flows are right and the workflows are right and you can literally and also if you can go to where they are through whatsapp and because whatsapp's becoming really malleable yes. in terms of being able to yes. deliver that kind of ai experience which i think is game changing because they're all on it yeah agreed. <laughs> so, and if we can get to that i think half the problem sometimes is lots of apps on their phones um especially work apps on their phones i think that becomes there's a bit of um app fatigue type yes, thing. Yes. Um, so if we can get some on WhatsApp, even better. Yeah, right? I mean, my phone's become like my handbag now. I can never find <laughs> anything on my phone. <laughs> Please say you couldn't find your phone. It's so true. And if you look at your um, percentage use on your apps, on your phone, there's like a, on the battery page. Yeah, yeah. I think my top, I have five apps I use for 80% of my battery. And the rest of it is just noise. <laughs> I've, I've just downloaded because I had to do something or whatever. I think, I think, I think that's crucial. And how did uh, uh, that... AI piece you just talked about there that's super exciting and how long does that <laughs> how long I know you mentioned is it Evo you said Evo how yes. long is Evo going to be before it well it's already rolling out it's already rolling out right. um, you know we've made investments over the course of last year a lot of it with AI of course is the um, you know everybody talks about AI right like everybody uses probably chat GPT yeah, that's, or I think that's Microsoft where most people version. think AI yes, is yes that. yeah absolutely I think one of the considerations in rolling out AI in a business is data privacy, mm. right? No business would want their data exposed to chat GPT no. because once it gets exposed to chat learns, GPT, yeah. it learns from that data and is used everywhere. You have no control over your data. And, and where especially that might be employee data or customer data, then you're actually infringing certain 
regulations, right? Do you think right? enough people know about, think like that? I'd I, and that's why I'm sort of sharing this yeah. because I think we sort of, we look at a consumer application and we go, oh, why don't we just roll out chat GPT, <laughs> right? Like how hard can it be? Well, it is hard because in the B2B space, we have responsibilities for yeah. data that we have of our employees and, um, you know, of our customers, right? So we've sort of made that investment to protect and ring fence. So when an AI capability is rolled out through an access product, it means that the data of the company is secure and it's used in a way that is acceptable, yeah. right? And so I think that is that is the investment we've made. And obviously then we find ourselves in a unique position because we have the product portfolio, because we can integrate between our products or integrate partners, obviously the AI capability will work with access integrated yeah, products that's, that's because we can crazy. leverage the data yeah. in a safe way between those products. So that's the investment we've made. And now it's sort of the tip of the iceberg where we start to bring those use cases to life across the different products. So we have our different teams who are thinking exactly about what are the use cases yeah. that would be of most value to our customers that we can start to put out into those products? So you'll start to see. If you can over solve onboarding, I think you'll be, uh, yeah, you'll have a, a rapid, a very busy line going because onboarding, I think, and the way we treat new employees, having my son just gone through this actually, uh, you know, just seeing how quickly he was onboarded through his new tech was really impressive. But I think that's, it's rare. I think there's a lot of use cases in pubs single site whatever you want to pick uh, and probably enterprise where they've had to I, I think it's the statement you said before about a new MD coming in or a new CEO coming in saying right here, I'm new here's my new approach that is definitely what they do of course they do they want to have an impact they want to change what they, and often that needs change yes but the problem with that you just don't take you don't take all the systems with you yeah and I think it's very rare that a CEO would sit down and say right I'm going to make a change firstly I'm going to let's bring all the tech together and see if it works with it because it's just not the way you would uh, no. previously think but it's definitely the way they should think yeah and I think that's where AI allows businesses to change their process and for the tech to be able to adapt yeah because you know today it's still like oh i need to do this first and then i need to do that first and i've got to do it but with ai it can be prompted it can be automated it can just happen it can all be mobile first which is another very important thing in hospitality yeah. everything has to be mobile yeah. first no one's in an office <laughs> exactly so yeah. the whole you know it's a paradigm shift yeah. and and in terms of the cost for us to be able to get this to market the time to market that's hugely exciting as well yeah. right because the ai capability enables us to do that it's amazing look i've only got time for one more question for you um I, I, it's not the one I was going to ask you, but it's about change management because you've been intriguing me with what you've done in your career and what you're doing now. Uh, I was talking to these operators about change management the other day about how they should approach um, change and what they should do. And there's a real... You could tell the room was really engaged for like half an hour while I was talking about it. I felt like I had them right there because I think that it's a real issue for them. In, in terms of you're going through change management with access and I'm sure you've gone through it in every other role you've done if you could leave people with a bit of advice around how they approach change even on a granular you know on a one site level what's your best advice sorry to throw that on you but I just <laughs> I think you've got a bit of experience in it so be, while you're here <laughs> well I can't pretend to have got it right every time no, I, I, right? And, and no one gets it right every time yeah. but I think there's definitely some structure around it oh. yeah so I think look if you had asked a much younger me <laughs> Uh, I'd have been like, you know, approach, you know, dive in, make change happen quickly, you know, that sort of thing. You know, the Facebook move fast and yeah, break yeah, yeah. things. I think with the benefit of, I, I prefer to call it wisdom, but probably gray hairs. <laughs> um, I would say it's the opposite of that Facebook philosophy. I think it's really important when making change, first to recognize what works. What's the magic that has to be preserved? and almost identify it and ring fence it so that you go, that bit, we do no harm. Because if we did, then the whole reason to make the change, you know, goes away, right? Because you've yeah. destroyed the, the kernel of so value. So where's the red exists. line? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, almost ring fencing. Yes, we want to make change because when you say you want to make change, you've identified all the things that don't work. So you don't <laughs> yes. need to focus on that. But stopping and asking, but what does work? And what should we absolutely not kind of infringe upon? And what should we protect? What's the essence of what makes us successful? That bit has to be preserved. 
And then you can go, right. And, and, and I think that's quite important psychologically as well, because when people go through change, it's uncertainty, it's fear, but it's also the feeling of having failed, right? Yeah. Like we're having to change because something in the past didn't work. And if we can say, actually, these things worked and we're going to protect it. And, you know, this is what you've helped build. And then we're going to try and make that better because we're going to change these things. That might be easier to accept as well in terms of, you know, the, the inevitable resistance to change. You know, it can be maybe a little bit lower than before. Yeah, and I think that that it's attached to experience as well, like you just said, if a bad experience. If if it's constantly negative, no one's ever going to change anything, right? Why would you? Why would you put yourself back through that? Right, look, brilliant. I think I could probably talk to you an hour, but I'm not allowed. Um, so uh, finally, um, in terms of change, what do you see coming up in terms of, I know Evo is coming for access, but generally, um, we don't want to talk about macro problems too much. There's too many of them. But what do you see coming down the line? Well, I think um, one of the things that you'll hear us more talking about is um, you know, how we can help front of house, right? Because of the product portfolio that we have, the propositions that we can bring to the table in the way that we stitch together the product portfolio or our partners or you know, the solutions that you already have that we can yeah. integrate with that solves a front of house uh, problem. Similarly, you'll hear us talk about accommodation as a as a space, whether that is hotels or pubs that offer accommodation, how we can help manage, you know, property management systems to distributing your content. We can distribute your room availability globally, for example. So you'll hear us talking about that, how we can solve problems in F&B in hotels and then end to end for operations for an F&B venue and how we can help solve those problems, either through an ecosystem approach or through an integrated platform uh, and a suite of solutions. So increasingly you'll hear us do that because I think what you find in hospitality is you can no longer just go, oh, I just want to swap out my scheduling software because of the problem we've said, you know, yep. there's a process here. And so you might be optimizing one part of the process and sub-optimizing another. So therefore, increasingly we find customers are looking at a, a part of a, a suite that they are looking for that is simple and we think we can solve those problems with the with the product portfolio we have. Perfect. Look, fantastic talk to you. I can't believe I've not met you before. I think you're ace. Uh, <laughs> lucky, Thank you. Lucky access. Um, but anyway, but uh, they can find access on the marketplace. There's, I think Actil are on there, Rotor Ready are on there, Trailer on our marketplace. So, and probably a few more I've forgotten about. But uh, and also, um, what's the website for access? Is it Access Hospitality? It's it's uh, no, it's the Access Group Access website, group. and then you can find the hospitality division within that. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll add that into the copy of the yes, uh, podcast so people can find it. Great. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you in. very and you're much, on a safe Chris. Where are we to now? Loughborough, was it? Uh, Loughborough is where our headquarters is. Okay. Yes. So uh, we have customer meetings there tomorrow. So I'm looking forward. Good to luck it. on the family train as it's going to be today. <laughs> <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Thanks thank very you. much. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye.